Hi there, everybody. This is Tracy Malone from NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. On my channel here on YouTube and on my podcast, I bring you experts, people who are going to teach us like about narcissists, teach us how to heal, and teach us how to move on. Today, my guests are Lisa Johnson and Chris Berry. They are a power couple that has found love with each other after narcissistic abuse. Are you wondering how will I ever love again? How will I trust again? If you are, then this interview is going to help you and inspire you and give you hope because that's what we want you to know. We want you to know that this is not the end and that there is life after narcissistic abuse. If you've never been to my channel before, please use the subscribe button down below and subscribe. And without any further ado, let's start by introducing and welcoming Chris and Lisa. Welcome, Chris and Lisa. Thank you so much for joining me. It's a Thanks pleasure being here, me. yeah. Yeah. You know, there's two great stories that I love about you. A, is that not that you were victims of abuse, but that you were victims of abuse that found each other afterwards and started, uh, been there, got out um, as, as your website, and, and, and that you're doing this work now to help each other and, and to help others. I love that about you guys. Thank but you. What I'm really wanting to talk to you guys about today is... Um, Really, how do we find love afterwards, after this kind of abuse? Because everybody asks, and how will I ever trust, and that sort of thing. So before we put the how will I ever trust in the game here, it's important to kind of see where you guys were. So I know that you were both in narcissistic relationships prior. Do you want to give me a little background on, on what you guys went through? I know you went through a lot of crazy, both of you. So um, the shortened abbreviated version of maybe just the, the, the journey of your divorces after being with someone like that, whatever you want to share. So who wants to go first? That's what I was going to think. You want to go first? Sure, I'll go first. So um, I knew my ex for, let's say, from when I met her until when we separated. It was 14 years. We separated in 2014. Uh, married for 10 of those years. We have two kids together. They're uh, teenagers now um, in high, high school-ish age. And um, all the typical stuff from narcissistic relationships, the, you know, the blaming and the walking on eggshells and everything you talk about, I would, we'd be on for an hour if I got into all the detail. But um, she actually left me. Um, which, you know, I look back at the kind of things she ever did because um, my, I'm a very resilient person and my, resi my resilience works against me at times. You know, I was, I could just endure everything. You know, I would have stayed forever. So um, she left in 2014. The legal stuff started. Uh, there wasn't a lot to fight over uh, except for custody, which she knew was super important to me because being a dad is, you know, really, it's the core of who I am. I, I love my sons and I, I love being a dad. And um, so our legal fight for no good reason other than power and control and her enjoying the fight took three years and cost $300,000. Um, and at the end, we just kind of ended up where the negotiations were starting pretty much, give or take a, a little bit. But, um, you know, through most of that process, I was living in terror, you know, um, worried that I'd be one of those like dinners Wednesday night and every other weekend kind of dads and that's not me. But I have them close to half the time and everything's great now. But oh, what a what a nightmare it was for a long time with the uncertainty, especially. Did she make lots of false allegations against you that you had? Oh, nonstop, nonstop. And the courts aren't equipped to deal with these situations. You know, as you well know, they, you know, they they assume it takes two to tango, right? If a, if, if a, um, a divorce is taking forever, it's both their faults, you know. Um, so I got... I got ripped in the in the courts personally, and I never, you know, one of the fallacies at the beginning of these processes um, is that you think I'll have I'll have my day in court, I'll be able to say, you know, make my case. I never really said anything except my name and address, and yes, I swear to tell the truth, and that was pretty much it the whole time. You know, lawyers spoke for me; it was negotiated. I never got to tell my story, and the courts wouldn't have cared anyway. Mm -hmm. They just wanted it off their docket. They want to know how much acid you have, you know, did they, are they safe to be with the kids? Have a nice day. Bye. Right. But $300,000 exactly. of that. Yeah. Yep. It, Cause it was the endless motions, 
and they canceled dates and rescheduling and in the beginning especially like trying to negotiate a settlement and oh our lawyer lawyer will draw it up and and like having to draft the document and then like a year later that's all just it was just wasted because you know everything was just rejected and we're hiring um you know attorney for the children and a psychological evaluators and all kinds of stuff it was it was a nightmare it was an absolute nightmare wow did the kids make it through okay um Lisa likes to say a, a quote she heard somewhere, they'll probably always walk with a limp, you know, um, but they're, they're good. You know, I don't think they're permanently damaged. The thing that I worry about is, you know, we share custody. So they're with a narcissistic mother about half the time. Mm -hmm. So everything I've read is that, you know, the kids can be okay as long as they have one emotionally healthy parent. So like my mission in life is to be as emotionally healthy as I can be. And Fortunately, you know, with Lisa in my life now, and my, my boys know her really well, um, they're seeing us model what a healthy relationship should look like. Right. So hopefully I'm un unraveling or undoing some of the stuff that they saw before. They're disgusted. <laughs> they're just like, stop, stop, like breaking up kisses, holding hands. Oh, that's so cute. No, no, they just joke around though. I think, I think they're... They know. Yeah, they, they know are. this is healthy and they know you know, that, that Lisa makes me really happy and vice versa. And, and we're modeling it for them. So good. all good. I think they'll be fine. That's good. Thank you for sharing that because I know everyone has concerns about, you know, how do the kids make it through three years of hell? While the kids aren't really in the courtroom, they don't even know much is going on. I mean, they, obviously they're sucked into court people and psychologists and all these evaluators and all this other stuff. But um, hopefully a lot of it became just um, a way of life and not like a dagger in their heart every time you got one. Um, so, yeah, yeah we're, we're, you don't want to do it. Everybody says this. You don't want to put them in the middle, right? And my boys, you could see them recoil anytime that they felt like they had to choose, you know, on, just on an issue. Like, do you want to go with mom's idea or dad's idea? They'd be like, yeah, you know, they pull back from it, mm -hmm. you know? So we just, uh, well, I do my best not to put them in that situation. That's, you know, that's kind of years behind us at this point. We've settled into a routine and we know the rules and. Right. Thank God. So Lisa, Indeed. tell us about your, your divorce. Okay. So I met my ex-husband right after I came back from backpacking through Europe um, and living in Europe overseas, teaching English in Southern Hungary in the early 1990s. So I was very young. Um, he was my landlord when I came back. I, <laughs> I had a different boyfriend. We broke up and the landlord swooped in and said, oh, let's have lunch. And it seemed very platonic. And I was never actually really in love with him or attracted to him. But he was like, seemed like the good friend type. Great, well, suppose it, you know, the mask. Great listener, loved to read, very cultured. Started taking me all these trips again. So on paper, everything looked great. So we were together. We were married for almost 18 years together for nearly 20. We have two kids. Um, both my kids, one is uh, going to be 18. The other is going to be 21 in a couple of months. Um, so several years ago, you know, and the thing with us, it was a very different type of relationship. I did not walk on eggshells. We did not fight. Um, he's a covert narcissist. I, neither Chris nor I knew anything about narcissism. Uh, throughout our entire marriages and even some points after until the divorces became so crazy and irrational that we were both like, what is going on? Right. We had met at that point. Yeah, we had met at that point. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, but my divorce took a year and $100,000, not including the past five plus years that I remain in the legal system battling my ex-husband for financial matters because he refuses to stick to the divorce agreement and refuses to comply with any court orders, basically. So I'm still in the muck. Um, my kids have had no contact with their father for years. Uh, they are old enough to make that decision. They've had, the first couple of years were really, really hard, but it's really the opposite for my kids versus Chris's kids. His kids have no idea what their parent is, and they'll probably find out, and it'll be really heartbreaking. My kids, I think, have had their heartbreak in the very beginning because I was advised to tell them the, the truth at the very beginning about that we are indeed getting a divorce, why we're getting a divorce, and put it all out there. And that's when they learned that their father really wasn't who he 
pretended to be for all these years and had been living a double life and they kept giving him opportunities. He didn't really show up for them in any way. And then he's, you know, he's now he lamely tries and they're just like, we're don't even bother. And the fact that he's still putting us through this, the financial abuse that continues, that's really against them. Um, they just, you know, so they're, they're doing, re my kids are doing really, really well, I think. Thank God. Yeah. So we are, I have now decided that on this video, we have now got a half a million dollars in divorce costs between us. Oh, but I didn't even Wait. add in my, my extra, I have saved half a million dollars in legal fees because I have had at this point, probably more than 60 something court appearances in two different states representing myself, uh, you know, and you can imagine, you know, how much time goes into planning every single appearance and every single motion and not being an attorney myself, having to get help and resources and, you know, so, so it's estimated about half a million dollars and now having to pay lawyers in the second state to try to enforce it. So it's just, it's, it continues. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So we're like the million dollar club. Yes, <laughs> the million dollar club. Only I, your guys are the 900,000 and I'm the little 100,000, which when people hear that, they're like, oh. They should be. It's, it's all too much. It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, why can't we just have a drive up window and go, I want that divorce and I'll take a custody and on the side, a little bit of pets, you know, custody. Fine, have a nice day. Because the other... The other side is going to go, no. <laughs> of course not. They're not. Not until we fight for a few years. Yeah. No, there's never been an easy, easy divorce. But when they get to be narcissistic divorces, they are expensive and crazy. And they don't end, right? They just don't end like Lisa's going through now. Um, I have a friend who's, who had a million dollar divorce. And she just found out this week that her husband's filing charges because she keeps sending him harassing texts and she's like, I've never sent him a single text, but now she has to defend herself. And I was like, just get your phone bill out. Like in five minutes, you can prove he didn't do it. Right. Because it would be there. And she's like, I didn't think about that. But you know, her lawyer yeah. probably thought of it, but said, sure, give me the extra hundred thousand for fighting this battle. And didn't yeah. want to tell her that. We're, we're, we're actually doing this week's workshop with been there got out on abusive litigation which is what your friend is dealing with what i'm dealing with how basically being trapped in the legal system you have to keep paying not only with money but with your time and energy to, to defend yourself to these ridiculous accusations and tracy as you know even when you prove things beyond a reasonable shadow of a doubt it still doesn't matter for certain judges no no so, I mean, very difficult now my next question to you guys is how do we start again how do we trust again? How did you guys meet? And um, how did you know that it was safe to trust somebody? Okay. Well, Tracy, I'll answer first. Um, so we actually have been influenced by a lot of what you have said, putting out there. And we didn't realize, at least I didn't realize that I was already doing a lot of, you know, some of the recommendations you had made. Of course, I found out years later. Um, I don't think that trust is something that you immediately know in the beginning. And so when I finally, well, first of all, it was really about a little over two years that I stayed in the marriage and planned my exit. So I already in my head had emotionally detached and knew I was completely done. And during that time, I know a lot of people kind of go wild and have affairs and drink or do whatever, but I told myself, you know what, you're still married and your kids are watching you. And so you have to keep thinking, what if they discover whatever about you? You don't want them to, to, to see you differently. So I thought, I'm going to take this head on. I'm going to like deal with everything, deal with all this pain, not distract myself, not bring someone else into my problems. And so I basically faced it head on, went to a trauma therapist. I've always been a journal writer too. I've been, I've been keeping journals since I was 13. So did tons of writing, which actually helped with documenting a lot of what was going on that I didn't realize I would need later. So the writing really helped. Um, I didn't tell, I hardly told anybody what was happening. Um, just a couple of friends. Unfortunately, I got some <laughs> bad advice, but it felt good at the time because they basically were like, oh, it doesn't make any sense, but he really loves you. Keep giving him more and more chances. That didn't work. 
And that I would have changed because we went to far too much couples counseling with different therapists. That was like, we always tell our, our people that's like a tremendous waste of time and to never do it. Um, Cause with an abusive person, it's, it's the, it has the opposite effect, make things far worse. Um, let's see. So, so I had those couple of years where it was almost like I was out in my head, even though he was still in the house, I couldn't get him to leave right away. Um, when I finally did get him to leave, it was a tremendous relief. I never looked back because like I said, I felt like I never was really in love with him. And when I realized that he had been living a double life for the entire time, I didn't, I didn't really grieve over him. And so I thought, now I'm going to try online dating because I completely missed out. You know, we were together for so long and I thought that'd be so cool, like to see what happens. So a friend of mine said, you know, do match.com because that's the best one. And in order to do it, you know, I had never, I think I told you this doing it during another interview, but I had never considered what I wanted for myself. I had let myself be emotionally led into practically every single romantic relationship of my life. And so I sat down and I made a list of things that I like in people, not just romantic people, but I, I did things like I said, you know, I, I want someone who has at least two passions because my ex-husband kept saying that I was fully responsible for his happiness. So I wanted to meet someone that had hobbies or interests that they enjoy that had nothing to do with me so that they could make themselves happy. I wanted someone who had close long-term relationships with friends and or family because I wanted that long history. You know, I didn't, I didn't want to just hear, oh, my latest friend thing. And this was before you knew about narcissism because yeah, that's like one that. of our red flags for narcissism right. is they don't have those healthy long-term relationships. Right. You know? I wanted someone who had really good social skills. Um, I wanted someone who volunteered because volunteering is a big part of my life. Um, I wanted someone who liked moving furniture because I always loved I go to tag sales all the time and I love like moving things around. And my ex-husband used to say it was churning and he hated it. Um, so, but I like, I like playing with things. So, so I had like this whole list and, and I put it out there and within like a couple of weeks, Chris responded. Yeah. And <laughs> it was I, crazy. It was crazy. Yeah. So as Lisa said, it was just a couple of weeks after her ex was actually out of the house. I was, it was a my few, first... few weeks after he was out. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it was different for me. At least when I met, it was probably about nine or about 10 months after my separation. And I had gone through, you know, as I said, she left me and I, unlike Lisa, I was really in love. Like I was, I was hook, line and sinker. You know, I was heartbroken. I cried every day. I wrote this really pathetic letter to her that I, I can't even, it's too cringeworthy to read now, but like begging her to come back. And I already even knew about the affair she had had, one of the first of several I would learn about. Um, so I, I had gone through the, you know, the stages of grief and the getting over being pathetic. And I was kind of getting my feet under me again. And I met somebody, I'd gotten a dog, a puppy. And at puppy school, I met a woman who, you know, we, it was a weird relationship. We were just friends. There was never anything romantic about it, but it felt like we were dating. So we were together like all the time. Um, and that relationship went nowhere, but what it gave me was sort of some, you know, like, okay, like I can meet somebody, even if it, this turns into nothing, I can meet somebody. And so I signed up for match, uh, you know, a couple months after my separation and I was on it for months and months. And if you've never used match, you get like a daily, like a, almost a digest email where they suggest, I think it's 10 potential matches. And it gets tedious after a while because it's like, no, no, no. <laughs> and there was one, like it was a Monday or Tuesday night and I was up and I was ready to go to bed, but Monday night, yeah. and I was up and ready to go to bed, and here comes the match email, and I was like, oh, I was going to just delete it, but I said, no, let me let me just go through it, or else, because if I don't put in the effort, I'm never going to really meet somebody. And I never, in the eight months or so I was on it, never met anyone, never I talked to a couple people on the phone, but that was about it. Um, so I'm going through, and I came across Lisa's, and I forget even what caught my eye about it. It was like her headline or something. And I read her profile and I was like, oh my God, it's like I wrote this myself. And the other day, as it so happens, yeah. Lisa and I found like in our computers, we had cut and paste. We've been on, off match for years, but we we were sitting with Lisa's daughter and she expressed a curiosity and mm. we were talking about our profiles. So I found Lisa's, I read it and I found mine and I read it. And it's inc 
incredible how similar they are. So I, I wrote to her, you know, this late this night, and we, it started us talking, and, and we got together. Oh, on, wait, so. <laughs> so she does he, this all the time. <laughs> but when he wrote that night, he wrote this short little thing, but he said, I saw your pro profile, and it sounds like I wrote it. Mm -hmm. Remember? Okay, yeah. now, now you can Yeah. <laughs> so we got to, I don't want to take up like too much time, but, okay. but we got together for like a lunch. It, we, neither of us were, like, I was a little more interested in romance. You were just looking for some, like, I wanted to out bagels, with. movie, lunch. Like I had said in the thing, like, I don't want anything serious. Yeah. So we went out to lunch on a Friday afternoon and we left a big block of time. I had two and a half hours and I was saying to Lisa, you know, in the email beforehand, like, I have a feeling we're going to run out of time. So the... The first thing that happened is I, I got to the restaurant first. She walked in. The two of us looked at each other, and we both went, no. nah. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, yeah, the opposite but, of love at first sight. It was yeah. like, mm, mm, mm But then we sat down to lunch, <laughs> and two and a half hours later, after this conversation, we were like, oh, my God. Like, they have so much in common, and we just really liked each other. Right, but it wasn't like a romantic thing. Yeah, and for you. I, <laughs> <laughs> what I what I really appreciated was that he didn't try to like kiss me or shake my hand or do anything like the stupid you know where he like hugs. I just was like, don't don't even don't. So he didn't. He was like, I can't believe it. I I just did the right thing without knowing it. So when we left, I remember afterwards I sat in the car and I was like, I just went on my first date in like twenty something years. And I had to sit and like check in with my feelings because I hadn't, I had never done that. Like I said, I had never thought about what I wanted. So a large part of, of getting into the whole dating and everything moving forward after a narcissistic relationship was pausing to check in and be like, how do you, how do you feel? And I sat there in the car and was like, you know, I really enjoyed myself. Like that was really easy. That was really comfortable. And at some point, as we were talking, both of us are very fast talkers. Um, during the, you don't say. <laughs> during the lunch, we were like, I, like Chris is really different. I mean, he's like got a background in football. He's like a former frat boy. I have never dated that type at all. But as he was talking and he's like so enthusiastic and his hands are going all over the place, I was like, this is like the male version of me. It was so weird and it felt just very comfortable. And so that was when, and I still wasn't thinking romance or anything, but that was like the beginning of like, you know what, this is, this feels okay. Right. So obviously you guys got along, you've been together for years. Mm -hmm. Next sort of thought that, that everyone has is how do we like handle sort of that, that that building of the relationship, like when things come up, is it, oh my God, that's exactly what my husband did. That's what my wife did. Ah, you know, the triggers that you had from the other relationship, how do they play into building again? And how do you sort of go, not the same circumstance, I'm going to move on past here. But they, at first, usually probably just went, ah, and like this earthquake tremor went, oh God, no. Like what happened? How did you guys get through those things? Well, can I, can I say so? so yeah, you yeah. go first. So one of the things very early on in our relationship was that we acknowledged to each other that, you know, the timing isn't great. Like we're still dealing with all this stuff. We hadn't learned about narcissism yet. We just knew we had really, really, diff we didn't know why our, our divorces were being so difficult and why there was so much conflict. But we, we had baggage. We had a lot of baggage. And we acknowledge that to each other. And we're like, you know, there, any therapist would say this is a terrible time to start a relationship, but we can't change when we met. I mean, these are the cards we were dealt. So we either find a way through it or we might miss this opportunity that seems like a really promising one. So that was, that was my first thought. The second was, um, you know, it's, it, I, I feel terrible for Lisa that she went through what she went through and is still going through it. And I know she feels that way for me, but I think if we hadn't both gone through this, it would have been too much to deal with. For or another person. Else. Like yeah. just take a, like a, I'll call it a civilian. You know, somebody <laughs> hasn't been through <laughs> right. these wars. You know, if, if Lisa hadn't gone through what she was going through, I don't think she could have dealt with my nonsense. Because I was, she used to tell me all the time early on that I was emotionally unavailable. Because I was still, you know, my ex would say, you know, our son needs his medicine right now. You need to come over. And I'd be sitting holding hands with her, sitting on like by the beach, 
And I'd be like, I have to go. I have to do, go. I would, yeah, and I'd jump. be like, you don't, you don't need to do that. Like we right. again, not knowing about narcissism in that, in that very in time. Very but, early, but I was just like, you don't, you don't need to jump at like ten thirty at night on your birthday, because, because his ex wife is the opposite. She calls constantly. Not mine, anymore. No, but mine is, mine is gone. He's gone. I just see him in court all the time, and I think that's why he continues it because we're, we're just psh, right. done. Yeah. So, so it, it was, and it's in a strange way, it's a good thing that we both had to deal with this stuff because it, it allowed us to have more empathy. We're both very empathetic people, but it allowed us to understand the, what we were going through because we were going, the other person was going through it too. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah. recommend that. For you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, the trust thing for me was really about like, you need to be honest with me and then like, you can't, you can't like lie about anything like that. That was my, my boundary. I was like, I cannot have lying because deception is, is everything. And so, you know, sometimes there'd be like a little thing that Chris didn't say. And then later I'd, I'd get like really upset and I'd see, I don't, it, it's not the same thing, but to me, like any little like withholding of information that you think is not important. Like you, I can't, I can't deal with that. Like I can't deal with, with someone not telling me something because it feels the same way, even though maybe to you, it's like nothing, but me, it feels, it brings back those same feelings of like, I can't count on you. Like I need to be able to count on someone. And, and if, if I can't, then, then I, the other thing is like, I need to be aware of what's happening because I want to make my own choice. Like I felt like in my marriage, my ex did so many things behind my back. That I never would have agreed to. And then at the end, he was like, well, you know, what's the big deal? I'm like, no, no, like that, like we had a contract and I didn't agree to that. So any little thing, I'm just like, you can't hide stuff because I want to make the choice. Like if you're doing something and you think maybe I won't like it or maybe I won't care, but there's even a question like, you need to let me know because I have to make the choice for myself. Don't make choices for me and assume I'm okay with it. Mm-hmm. That was like the biggest thing for me. And it felt sometimes, sometimes for me, it felt like, you know, if I had, there was some little transgression, whatever it was, that I was almost like um, paying the price for how her ex mm. had behaved, you know, but I had to remind myself like that those feelings are valid. You know, she's, she was traumatized. I didn't have the, that vocabulary then, but that she had been traumatized. She'd been through a lot and I, I had to understand that. Yeah. Yeah. When you, and, and when you love thing- someone who has been through trauma, like you have to like the, the the patience and understanding is like nothing anyone has ever experienced because they have lost all confidence in themselves mm-hmm. and they have lost all confidence in the lying and the cheating and you know not doing what you say when you say you're going to do it is a trigger a lot of people exist like so if you just whoops, I forgot that I was supposed to be there. You know, you might as well get out the machete because she's coming after you. Um, it's, it's, it's all of the triggers that we all experience that going through dating in this situation, regardless of the fact that you both were abused is so hard. But the fact that you both were, you both had a backpack full of crap behind you that was sometimes the same. And yet because of the overt covert kind of thing, there's more deception on Lisa's end than it would have been for you where you were just like, okay, I can take this. I am, I'm a big guy, I can take it. I love her, I'm staying for my kids. I wanna be with my kids. And she's just like, her head is spinning. And, and um, you know, it, it was so different. And yet, of course, being the same. So were there triggers for you? Like, as she said, lying was so important to her. What was it on your side that you thought were, if she does this, I'm going to need to speak up? Well, so that's a, that's a big thing for me is um, I have boundary issues. Um, I, again, I don't want to turn this into a seven hour phone call, but stuff from my childhood with my dad, where, you know, he left, he left my mom and then he kind of abandoned me. So I always, I was kind of, brought up to feel like I had to be the pursuer and that love was conditional. And I, I was always in, you know, in pursuit and I was always subordinating my feelings. I'd, I'd like let people take advantage of me. And I was just sort of learning about that as, as an adult um, coming out of this, this marriage. Um, so, you know, I, 
I'm too trusting, too naive, and I was still like that early in our relationship. So I don't know. Do you feel like I had anything that, like, I... Well, I, I wanted to say an example, but she asked you the question, so yeah. I was calm and waited my turn because I yeah. know I often interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm requesting the interruption because I just feel like I was just, like, I just opened up. Yeah. Willingly, okay. thank God you weren't another one. I know, another I know, I know. Well, I'm trusting and naive, too, as are so many of our people watching, I'm sure. Um, but anyway, one thing that um, that happens a lot and that I can sense might happen with Chris is in my relationships, the other person would say, I love you first. And sometimes they say it right away. And I would feel obligated to say it. And once again, not really think about if I felt that way. So when we first got together, um, you know, even though we weren't physically attracted to each other on the first date. Well, that was the first 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the second date was a different story and a whole a whole other longer thing for another day. But it turned out that we actually do and did have like tremendous chemistry. So, you know, it was like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. But yet, I, like, I don't want to take things like super, super fast because we both had kids. You know, neither of us, I certainly didn't ever want to get married again. Um, the different households, we would, didn't want to disrupt the kids' schedules, but <clears throat> I could feel that um, that Chris might be another person that said, I love you right away. So I specifically said to him, like, one thing that's important to me is I don't want you to say I love you. I, I want to be the one to say it first. Like, I just, like, whatever you feel, please keep it to yourself. Like, I need to be able to have to, to do this for myself. And so... I waited and we all, we also waited a little bit to have sex too. I mean, even though he says it wasn't, mm, there were, we cheated a little bit, but <laughs> you know, but I wanted to like wait on some of the intimacy stuff because I felt like I never took the time in the past. Maybe. So yeah. So with the, I love you, like we waited, you know, and even though we got together all the time and we sensed that the other one felt it, and we use like code words instead, yeah, or he did. I treasure you. Right? <laughs> I cherish you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, don't, don't say it. Um, and I, I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So on our two month anniversary, we went to this beautiful place, and I didn't say it. And then I waited till our three month anniversary, and then I I said it, and he cried, and it was so cute, and it was like, but it felt like it felt like really right. I mean, even though we're like complete adults and everything, I. It, it felt good to be the one in control of the situation instead of allowing myself to be once again emotionally led into the relationship. Right, and and that's an important part. You know, when people are looking to start again, slow it down. You right, know, that is the, the key mark. And if they're not willing to slow it down, that's a sign right there. You know, it doesn't matter how crazy in love they are with you if they can't slow it down. There's something I would just go red flag. Bye bye. Um, it, it, it just, it, it would be too scary for me. Like, as you're saying, I would be like, no, no, no. In fact, when you guys, when you first said that we we're talking about your beginning of the date, I've been on four dates in the last, they were all in one summer and it's like three years ago. So it's been a long time, but the first guy, you know, I, I we go to happy hour. He, he splits a happy hour appetizer and he buys me a beer and we talk for an hour and on the way to the car, he like grabs my hand and I'm just like, I don't even know your last name yet. Like, don't fucking grab my hand. Sorry. I yep. But like, it, it was just too soon. Like, I don't, I didn't know his last name. He was a match guy. I didn't know his last name. So I didn't think that he had the right after a half an appetizer and a beer to sit there because that was the rushing of intimacy. I was like, if I felt it, even if I felt it and I didn't for this guy, obviously, I would have like still said it has to slow down because that's how the narcissist always operates that they knock you off and don't go so fast so it's very confusing and i would protect myself against that one forever yeah and tracy actually with the trust thing what we just were talking about the fact that he did respect that i wanted to take my time that made me that made him earn my trust because he didn't push me so, so I felt like I could, I could relax and we could take things slowly. And, and that made me like grow to, to trust him little by little. Yeah. And I tell people like when they're just like, how will I trust again? I'm like, it's not like you go to Starbucks and go, I met this guy for an hour 
awesome. I trust him, right? Mm -hmm. If we think about it that way, we probably did do that with the narcissist. We went right into trusting whether it was what they do or who they are or who they're pretending to be. We trusted them. We gave false trust to somebody when the reality is trust is earned with thousands of trustworthy moments. You proved to me you're going to be here at seven, get here at seven. You proved to me this. And again, it's not a proved thing. It's for both that we feel so safe and confident that it's moment after moment of not being a shithead. That would really help. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> as simple as that. You know, how many times have I, have, did I show you guys my little, my bingo thing? I have like a bingo board. I made it. Yeah. Um, for for my girls in one of my groups and it, it was like they were like how will we know if we can trust them again and they're like wouldn't it be good if it was like bingo you're out so I made this <laughs> eating lying not showing up and all these different things so that like you can go bingo in any direction and if they if they end up I'm sorry I'm I'm, I'm going off off here <laughs> Um, so, anyway, so now that we have talked about you guys and your relationship and starting again, I know that you guys have your website, um, been there, got out. Um, can you tell people, I know you coach people, you have some courses. How can people learn more about what you do and what do you do in the next 11 minutes? <laughs> sure. So, well, the easiest way is to go to been there, got out.com. It's all one word. Um, but I, I, the, the thing is you know, I remember a conversation I had with Lisa where we had learned a bunch about narcissism and, and all other toxic personality disorders. And I looked at her and I said, if I knew this stuff when I was going through my divorce, like early on, if I could go back and coach myself, I could have saved half of those three years in the legal system, at least half of that $300,000 in, in, in just wasted money. And, and there must be so many other people out there who have this issue. You forgot the energy. So, Oh yeah, the time, the time, we always say time, money, and, and energy. Yeah, uh, emotional energy, and that's the the fear. Yeah, you know? confusion. All that stuff. Chaos. So it, it actually started as a book project. We wanted to write a book that's more. There's tons of books out there, as you know, um, but ours was going to be a little different. Take like a practical guide, beginning to end. So some legal stuff, not legal advice, but how you deal with it. Um, but so soup to nuts. And then we talked to this one literary agent. And he said, don't write a book. No, you know, that's, nobody makes money with books anymore. It stays on the shelf for two, for six weeks. And then you get $5,000 if you're lucky, forget it. He said, but do write a book, but then make that book your calling card for, you know, either an online course or some other kind of business, coaching business. So we took that advice and um, through a long it's it's been a, a long process getting up and, and going. Well, it's been a year. But yeah, about a, a year. year. Yeah. Um, where we've learned about the people you know in this market, the people that you serve, the people that, that we're serving, um, and what they need. You know, so when somebody comes to us and they've got a, a an issue, will like Lisa does an amazing job. She has a background as a teacher, so and also an author. And um, crisis counselor and a crisis counselor and domestic <laughs> violence advocate. <laughs> yeah, so so Lisa does almost all of like the course creation, mm -hmm. um, and we're just putting them up one by one on our site. So we've got like a, if you go to our website, you'll see um, uh, work. Um, what does it say now? Workshops. Enroll now. Uh, enroll now. Yeah, enroll but it's, now. we call it Sanity School. Yeah, because our tagline is what is our tagline? We provide. I always forget it. Hope, guidance, and community to people suffering in or struggling to get out of relationships with toxic personalities. So, so they, they can find the strength they to get, need. To get their sanity back. Yeah. Hey, you guys are like so cute together. <laughs> <laughs> just squish you up. So, so they can take these courses. Um, do you guys coach people as well? or? Um, well, so because, you know, like... The, the giving thing, like I, we haven't done an official coaching thing. We talked to a lot of people. We've done what we call like a rapid, rapid response call where people email and then they were like, want to get on the, the phone for something quick, but we haven't established like a full coaching program. And because we've been, because this past year practically has been during the pandemic, we are doing our courses as on-demand recordings 
um, with, with exercises in between because people don't have privacy and they don't have access to money and the kids are home because of, um, you know, the pandemic. So we found that, you know, we had wanted to do a lot of live coaching. It just isn't working. Our people are all over the world and in different time zones with different work schedules. So we can't, we can't do the live, um, coaching part, but, but, and, and I think the other thing is, you know, we want to reach and have an impact on the most people we can, you know, so I would rather have a thousand people, you know, take a $27 course and have it really help them, you know, help move them along to whatever, wherever they are, you know, if they get them from point A to point B or point F to point G, wherever they are in the process, mm -hmm. uh, if it can help them just that little bit, I'd, I'd rather reach a lot of people. Yeah. So we really broke it down. Like when we were thinking about the book idea, we broke it into three different sections. So the first one is like our, we have a course called wake up and smell the narcissist that we want to turn into a board game, but it's really like understanding what the heck is going on. So we started this little series this, this past this fall um, that we called our lifeboat series, where it was like common manipulation tactics, how to regain your confidence, and how to stop repeating the cycle, because that was what our community said they wanted help with the most. But then there's a whole other bunch of people, clearly, who have legal issues, and I feel like I have become such an expert from representing myself and being in court for six years. So I have so many tips, and like in our live support groups outside of our business, um, you know, I've been able to informally coach people through what to do. And then the last part, which we're really getting into now, is how to heal not just yourself, but your children. Because we found that so many people will, I just was writing this on our Instagram thing to someone today. They, because one of our, one of our big people who always is engaging was saying like, I, I'm so big, I'd rather not get therapy for myself. I'll do anything for my kids. So people are so, and that's the type of personalities we're dealing with. Like that, like, let me do everything for everybody else. Even if I'm like dying in the process. Right. So we really want to start focusing on that, that later aspect of like healing your kids, but also somehow get them to start dealing with themselves at the same time. Right. That's, that's exactly what people need. So I know that you guys also have a podcast cause I was just interviewed for it. I don't think it's launched yet, but you guys have a podcast. Is that the same name so they can find you? Um, no, we, we haven't actually done the, the podcast with, we put video, we, we yeah. use the videos in our blogs. Um, we've talked about a podcast, but that's, that's not something we've done yet. Well, not, not only in the blog. So, so what we've done for each of these courses that's is right. I like to interview somebody with a lot of experience or an expert, and then we attach it as part of the course. So they don't just get our, like my research, our experiences, but they get an outside person. Like we've interviewed you, we've interviewed trauma therapists. The best one, I, the best example I know was your, it, we did a course on safety planning. Like if you're still in the relationship, like how do you line everything up so you can safely exit? And Lisa interviewed a, a 34 year yeah. police officer here in her town uh, who was the one that started the local domestic violence program with the police department here, which became a model for the entire state of Connecticut. Yeah, it was called the Special Victims Unit, so that mm -hmm. they specifically train a certain branch of the police to deal with domestic violence victims. But he gave me all kinds of, you know, he's very well respected and really nice person. Um, and he gave me lots of like really interesting advice on what people should do, like even during an argument, and um, so that's included with, with the workshop. So the workshops are really like chock full of information. Yay. <laughs> well, everybody, I want you guys them to go to your website, learn more, read more. You got a great blog out there. And I noticed that you're wearing your shirt. Right. Yes. <laughs> Three. Whoops. Wait, here's yeah. the third one. I took my third off so we get a hold of thrivers. You guys are truly sir thrivers and I want to thank you for sharing this with me today. People are always wondering how do we start again to find love. So thank you. You guys are the role models of everybody. You're the successful recovery couple. And I'm so excited and honored to have you here. Thank you for joining me. Oh, our pleasure. Yeah, Tracy, thanks so much. And I, I, I hope that your community um, gets hope out of this because that's the hardest thing. It's the first thing that people need mm -hmm. is to just envision that things can get better. Yeah. And both so, of us never, never imagined that we would even leave our relationships. We were together for decades, 
you know, in our marriages with kids, we, we were just like, this is it. Like, this is our life forever. Yep. We right. never imagined that we would find this kind of happiness and like true healthy love. Oh, well, that's what we're all after. I will look to you guys when I go out there someday again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I sure hope that helped you guys learn a little bit. Um, weren't they fun? I liked interviewing them so much. They are such a cute couple, and it was fun to be on um, recording with them, as well as them having them on my channel. So go check out their website, beentheregotout.com. And if you are looking for more support to understand this narcissistic stuff, YouTube is not the only source. My website called NarcissistAbuseSupport.com um, services all those countries. See all those pins up there? Those are just some of the people that we help on our, on our website. We have lots and lots of resources. And um, go visit my website. And, and if you're interested in need coaching, need some extra advice, you can find all that information on there. So until next time, thank you so much for joining me and we'll see you again soon.